Now, the last thylacine, better known as the notorious Tasmanian tiger, died in captivity in 1936. But was it the last? In Queensland's isolated Cape York Peninsula, there have been multiple sightings over the decades, and Professor Bill Lawrence from James Cook University thinks you can't rule out the possibility that they might be out there. Professor Lawrence, welcome to the MAG. Thanks, Em. Good to be here. Uh, now, look, do we take these sightings with a pinch of salt? Is it a bit like sort of people, you know, sighting Uf UFOs? Or is there real evidence here to suggest that there might be Tasmanian tigers out there? I wouldn't put it quite in the same category as UFOs. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 you know, overall, I'd say it's, it, it's, it seems pretty unlikely. But I guess I'm a, a believer that you can never say never. And we've discovered so many things that we thought were extinct and turned out not to be extinct. And we're stumbling across new species all the time. I think it just gives me a bit of a sense of humility. And I think it's a bit, you know, it's almost a bit arrogant for, for scientists and biologists to say that we know everything. And particularly when you get into some of these more remote areas. So I'm, I've talked to the chap who, who made this sighting back in 1983. And I talked to him quite a lot. And then I went and, and he was describing it in, in, you know, quite specific detail. I mean, I think whatever he's, Whatever he's talking about, he's fair dinkum about in terms of he saw this, uh, he, you know, he thinks it was something strange. He saw this, uh, what appeared to be stripes on the side of the animal. He got red eye shines. There were several individuals. And I've been doing a little bit of uh, uh, Internet research on eye shines. And, I mean, I've, I've been spotlighting probably thousands of times. Um, so I do know the eye shines of a lot of different animals, and you do tend to get characteristic colors. And the most obvious things that would pop up to me, the, the key thing is to understand is that you get a lot of things in the bush that, if you don't get a really good look at them, can fool you. Um, the feral pigs can have, come in all kinds of colors and sizes. Um, the, do, the dingoes hybridize with dogs. Um, but dog eye shines tend to come out pretty distinctively yellow or with a greenish shade. Sometimes when they're looking at a funny angle, you can get different colors. But this guy says he had four of them looking straight at him, like 20 feet away. So, and he's really confident about this red color. Now, nobody seems to really know for sure what a thylacine's eye shine was like, but I do know that some animals in the rainforest here, for instance, Lumholtz's tree kangaroos and green ring-tailed possums give a red eye shine, and some things give yellows, and you know, there's a distinctive colors. So I, I don't know what to say other than... Um, we, I think what somebody could do is to get these really fancy automatic camera traps that we have now. They're very high tech and go out to, and he actually offered to take, if someone's willing to do this, to take them right to the site and to set out some of these camera traps and just have a look. See, it would be just interesting as a general faunal survey anyway of a pretty poorly explored area, you know, in the, in the Cape York Peninsula. Mm. Um, but, you know, on balance, I'd have to say, uh, you know, if I were a betting man, I'd say, you know, I wouldn't bet the house on the fact that somebody's going to stumble over a thylacine. It would just, it, it begs, real, you know, plausibility. And there have been sightings before. Um, there's been, you know, so-called documented sightings in Tasmania. And in a few cases where they're able to really check carefully, they found that they were fox sightings. And in some, one cases there was dung, and it turned out to be fox dung. So, look, I don't know, but I can just tell you that I could give you about 10 examples of really conspicuous species that have been that were thought to be extinct for hundreds of years, in some cases in millions of years, and yet they were rediscovered. Wow. So wow. to sit around and say that we know everything, you know, is just not on. Yeah. Well, can you tell us a little more about the Tasmanian tiger? Because it was the largest carnivorous marsupial of modern yeah. times. Yeah. How, how would a, an animal like that become extinct? Well, they're not really sure. Um, it was pretty clear that in Tasmania, so by the time Europeans arrived, um, it appears that the thylacines were largely or entirely wiped out from the mainland and, and mainly uh, or entirely survived in Tasmania. There, they were clearly persecuted heavily by you know bounty hunters uh, hired by the sheep industry. And there's some evidence that distemper from dogs might have had an impact on them. Um, you know, various suggestions. Certainly it seems that competition with dingoes, when dingoes were introduced a few thousand years ago, probably had an impact on thylacines. They didn't seem to uh, evidently compete well with them. Um, but they were, they were very dog-like in their behavior. They sort of hunted in packs. 
Um, they looked a lot like a dog, I mean, aside from the you know, distinctive striping. They had this amazing jaw. I mean, this jaw, if you see the, the jaws on them, that can open, you know, an incredibly large jaw gape. And they hunted a lot like dogs, and the dogs kind of tend to wear down their prey, and evidently that's the way that they, they would chase an animal until it was exhausted and then attack it as a group. So they're, they're pretty wolf-like, you know, mm. in, in the way they seem to behave. Um, and, I, you know, I just guess as a biologist, an animal that size, it's just a bit difficult to imagine. If, if they did persist in a remote area of Australia, it would have had to be a small population, and it would have to be, you know, um, in a pretty remote area for mm. someone not to have encountered a skin or a skeleton or something. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it, it doesn't – it's not – Entirely implausible. I'm just saying that, um, you know, I, I think one has to be a bit humble about about all these, you know, unknown unknowns. But I, I, I would, you know. But now the other thing I have to say on the other side of it, I've talked to the guy, and he's really convinced, you know, that he's he's he saw something that he couldn't describe, and he said it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't a dingo and it wasn't a pig. And I sort of, you know, queried every possibility I could think of, and he he was confident it was not one of these things. So, and he seemed to be a pretty good bushy that knew what he was doing out there. So, I, you know, I'm not quite sure what to say. <laughs> well, well, if, if, even if there is a small population out there, it's not necessarily a, a wise thing to go out and, and and resurrect it, is it? What's the risk of interfering and and sort of you know bringing a species back? Well, I guess there's two issues. If if it's rare and if it's there, well, then it would be an incredible find. I mean, it would be it would be it would stop the Earth on its axis in terms of rediscovering a species like that. Um, one of the things you'd probably do is you'd set up a you know a thylacine world heritage area around that and protect and especially manage that area for thylacines. And and if you could manage the population and and increase its uh, abundance, you know, you could possibly have the basis of a really, you know, impressive tourism industry, ecotourism industry, for example. But, uh, you know, quite a few assumptions there. Um, there's been discussion by, for instance, uh, Mike Archer, uh, a, a well-known biologist and paleontologist in New South Wales, who's actually been talking about trying to clone thylacines and, and trying to, you know, resurrect them um, and, you know, not just call the wild, recall of the wild. And that's gotten people's attention. Um, I don't know that much about the technology, but if we're, you know, um, it seems like we're starting to move in the direction. I think that would be truly an amazing thing if you could try to somehow genetically re resurrect um, a species that had completely disappeared like that or mm. evidently disappeared. Like something out of a science fiction film or something like that. Well, yeah, it's Jurassic Park. Isn't yeah, it? that's what I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, 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 and it's exactly what Jurassic Park is about. It's basically taking those kinds of things, cloning them, and 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 creating new creatures. Uh, so, you know, so I, I mean, all of this is a little bit on the fringes. Let's be, you know, be frank here. But I think there's enough intriguing stuff there to probably warrant. You know, I think if you had an adventuresome person, um, I've got about a hundred of these camera traps. I'm going to talk to my research center that I direct here at James Cook University, I'm going to talk to, to our folks. And if, if somebody wants to put their hand up and go do this, I'll lend them the equipment. And, uh, you know, I think it would be a fun thing to do. The other thing is, what's the worst that could happen? You could probably go out and find some other cool animals. <laughs> That's right. And, uh, you know, end up with, you know, no matter what you do, it's going to be interesting. And, and uh, there, is a, there is a part of the human psyche that likes the unknown, you know, and I think biologists are not immune to that either. We like to go out and poorly explore places, and, and who knows? I, look, let me tell you, on the Cape York Peninsula right now, they're finding several new species every year, and not the insects. We're talking about frogs, lizards, other kinds of things. So it's clear that we don't know everything about, you know, large parts of Australia. Um, just whether or not something the size of a, you know, a large dog could be, which was a social hunter, uh, could be persisting in an area, you know, that's... Uh, it's, um, well, I'll just say it challenges, uh, you know, uh, easy belief. But, again, I'm, I, I think we, you should never say never because there's been too many times we've been proven wrong.
Yeah. Oh, well, look, it's a fascinating discussion and um, we'll certainly, uh, you know, await some further, you know, research or some more evidence, but um, certainly food for thought anyway. Professor Bill Lawrence, thanks so much for joining us and having a chat about the topic this morning. Pleasure, Anne. Thank you. Thank you.